<clears throat> so this is the outline of the talk, uh, and I will split this in two parts. Uh, the first part is kind of going back to the basis where we'll uh, look at the clinical definition, prevalence, genetics of HCM, uh, what is the clinical course, and what uh, factors determine the symptoms in this population. Second part is going to be the evaluation and management uh, of, of these patients. So let's start with the, with the first part. Uh, hypertrophic, uh, uh, before we start, uh, I uh, include a few cases here to kind of break the ice. Um, this is a 52-year-old uh, male with obstructive hypertrophic gramopathy presents with dyspnea. Uh, his echo show a gradient of 100 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the patient was treated medically, as you can see here, his pressure gradient uh, dropped down to 60, but the patient remains uh, uh, short of breath. Uh, any takers, any comments on that, on those images? It's not, it's not a tricky case, which is... Dr. Drakers, Sorry. what are you seeing there? You see the hypertrophic, you see the mitral valves are moving forward. Very good, very good. So these are transesophageal images, and as you mentioned, you have that septal bulge there, that uh, septal hypertrophy, you have the mitral valve, and you have the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, right? Um, second case, 70-year-old female, HCM, she has no obstruction of the uh, outflow tract. Uh, the patient had a previous ICD uh, for primary prevention. Uh, she presents extremely fatigued. And, and short of breath. So she was taught on medical therapy, but she remains symptomatic. So what do you see there? Ah, so she has epical, uh, epical mid-HCM, right? And if you look at the cavity of the left ventricle, look at the size of that cavity, right? Very, very small, all right? So this, is, this gives you an example of how, how heterogeneous this disease can be. Okay. So start with the basics. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common inherited form of cardiomyopathy. Um, um, and uh, by definition, it's left ventricular hypertrophy that is unexplained by the abnormal loading conditions. If you have a patient that has severe aortic stenosis and has severe hypertrophy, that is not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And a patient that has a subaortic membrane, that is not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, uh, cardiac amyloidosis that is getting sexier and sexier, that is not uh, <laughs> hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right? So what degree of, of, of hypertrophy is significant enough? So in adults, a uh, uh, wall thickness of more uh, equal or more than 15 millimeters. Now, if you have a relative with HCM, uh, 13 millimeters will do. Or a patient that has a no genetic mutation, 13 millimeters uh, will qualify. Now. Briefly, the prevalence, the prevalence, as you'll see, read most uh, papers, book, articles, uh, one in 500. Uh, however, this is based on very old data, uh, registry, echo registry, looking at patients with uh, uh, coronary atherosclerosis risk factors. But now with the uh, advancing uh, imaging, including echo, cardiac MRI, the prevalence of HCM has, has increased. Now, adding genetic testing to the picture, the prevalence has increased and has been reported even as high as one in 200 patients. As I said, this is the most common form of inherited cardiomyopathy. It's transmitted in an autosomal dominant pattern uh, for the most part. We have identified 1,500 mutations in more than 11 uh, genes uh, that involve the, sar the sarcomere. 90% of these are mean sense mutations, which means that you're replacing a base pair by an, uh, uh, and this results in uh, replacement or one amino acid, which is going to change the function of, of that protein, right? And if you look, look at this side, which is the most important part of this slide, you'll see that the uh, most common mutations involve myosin branding protein C, myosin heavy change, and troponin T. If you know all those, only these three genes, that involves, uh, that involves 90 percent of the genetic uh, mutations that leads to this disease. Now, in this side, you can see some, something that we call phenocopies or uh, mimickers of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that we already discussed, some amyloidosis, some uh, infiltrative uh, and, and metabolic disorders as well, which I'm not going to touch on today. Now, this is just to highlight that HCM is very heterogeneous, it's diverse, right, at the genotype and the phenotype level. So you can see here, uh, different genes can lead to the same phenotype, right? More importantly, more interestingly, I would say that one gene can lead to different phenotypes, even if it's in uh, brothers or sisters, 
they can have the same mutation, they can present in totally different ways. And, and we see that very often in our clinic. Why is that? That is probably related to environmental factors, epigenetic modifications, and post-translational modifications. So what happens with those genes? What, what, where's the result of these genes? Well, let's start with the normal. So in the normal uh, myocyte, you have entry of calcium after excitation. The calcium uh, binds the myofibers and then goes back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Here in this um, clip, what you're seeing is the, the effect of calcium on the sarcomere, on the myocytes. And you can see that the calcium binds the troponin C. That changes the configuration of the uh, tropomycin and exposes the sites where the myosin heads are going to bind, right? With HCM, what happens? You have increased um, affinity for calcium, increased sensitivity for calcium. And as you can imagine, you have increased sensitivity for calcium, you have more sites, so they're increased in the cross, uh, in the cross bridges there. Now, this, uh, there's also increase in that ATPS activity. So all this, what, what, in, in, in lay terms, what, what is happening with the sarcomere? The sarcomere now is working uh, like an engine that is providing, is very powerful, it's very, uh, the, the, it's increasing sliding velocities of the sar sarcomere, but it's working in a very efficient way, right, which leads to energy depletion uh, in the cell. This energy depletion along with the abnormalities in the calcium cycling are gonna result in ACM signals that are gonna lead to fibrosis and hypertrophy, right? At the tissue level, what happens? You have compared with the normals, you can see that there's hypertrophy of the cells. There's also disarray that you can see in the HNE that you can also see compared with normals, you can see in the electron microscopy. And when you do trichrome stain where you see the fibrous tissue is blue, you see there's also fibrosis. At the organ level, you see typical manifestation, isometric cell hypertrophy. But again, this is diverse. You can also see different phenotypes which involve also concentric diffuse uh, hypertrophy. With the use of MRI, again, you can see typical ash, you can see concentric hypertrophy, but you can see other patterns, like in this patient that had localized uh, hypertrophy to interoceptin. As you, you can imagine, this was picked up by MRI now advancing in, in imaging. It would be very difficult, would be very difficult to visualize with echo, HC, apical HCM, as we have already shown. From the clinical perspective, uh, patients also have broad a clinical spectrum. For the most part, this is a benign condition. Uh, patients will live and have a normal longevity, right? Some patients can present with heart failure symptoms, some are gonna present with atrial fibrillation and stroke, uh, which happens in about 20% of the patients, and sodium cardiac death uh, with a rate of about 1% per year. When we talk about heart failure symptoms, uh, the symptoms include usually symptoms related to congestion, also symptoms related to low output, but also the symptoms could be related to LVOT obstruction. Which take us to, to the determinants of symptoms in this patient. Let's start talking about patients uh, with obstructive HCM, right? So what defines obstruction of the LVOT? Uh, obstruction of the LVOT is defined by a gradient of 30 millimeters of mercury or more at rest or with provocation maneuvers, right? A hemodynamically significant gradient is a gradient above 50, usually. Rule of thumb, one third of the patients will have obstruction at rest one third, another third of the patients will have obstruction with provocation maneuvers, exercise, valsalva, uh, standing, uh, postprandial, and another third of the patients will have no obstruction. So what are you seeing there? Uh, pretty straightforward, where you see the typical ASH, asymmetric septal hypertrophy, and you have the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve with contact. So, but what do we know about the, ter the determinants of obstruction? What are the terms of obstruction? Hypercontractility, I told you about what the mutations are causing. So this is a functional subject for obstruction. Now, prominent septum, the mitral valve and papillary muscles. The papillary muscles typically in this population, in these patients are localized anteriorly. So they drag the coaptation point anteriorly. Uh, so when the systole happens, the blood flow is redirected by the prominent septum, the septal bulge. This catches the valve from behind and drags the valve to the outflow track. And that's early in systole. Uh, as is shown here in this echo study using, using uh, uh, BBI, right? You can see compared with normals where the blood flow is homogeneous and lives through the LVOT, you can see how the blood flow catches the valve from behind and drags that to the LVOT, right? Well, this is what happened predominantly in early systole. After septal contact, you have essentially a spiral where that narrow orifice, 
now uh, causes a pressure gradient between the LV and the AO, and that pressure gradient is push, gonna push the valve against uh, the septum more, it's gonna narrow the orifice and the gradient gets worse and worse. This is gonna result in what we know as the classical dagger-shaped CW, right, where you have no obstructive flow up to this point, but uh, 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 forward, you'll see that this is, this again, this is related to obstruction, the dynamic uh, LVOT obstruction. Why this is important? This is important because all the treatments that we use are essentially targeting, or the, our goal is to slow down the acceleration, right? We use beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, trying to slow down the acceleration of flow so we can delay septal contact. By delay septal contact, the gradient is gonna be lower. Another way to, to see this is, uh, uh, is in, in this example where we're using essentially a catheter to measure pressures in the LV and the AO to look at the gradient. We, we superimpose that into an M mode of the mitral valve. There's no contact, there's no gradient, right? The contact happened late and brief, there's a little bit of gradient. Right? Well, you see that when the contact happens very early and it's prolonged, there's a significant gradient. I want to highlight something that is very important. This is not a disease of the muscle only. This is a disease that also affects the mitral valve. Right? And this, in this study, is an old study that showed uh, where we compare normals and patients with HCM, you see that the area, the thickness and the weight of the mitral valve, particularly of the anterior mitral valve, is increased. You can see the valve in a normal uh, patient compared with the valves in patients with HCM, which is increased. Why this is important? This is another case. Any takers? Okay, so in this case, we're seeing a, a patient that has, again, you see this, the thickness of the, of the septum. How is that looking to you? What do you think? It doesn't look that, it looks thick, but it doesn't look that thick. It's not that typical ash, right? But look at the mitral valve. The mitral valve is almost prolapsing through the, through the LVOT, right? And this is important, uh, and if you see the color, it's not, it's not moving, but uh, if you see, and then you see the M mode, you see how the mitral valve just stays up there, similar to the M mode that I showed you before, and this patient has a gradient of 200 millimeters of mercury. Right? Why this is important? This is important because if this patient goes to the operating room, and you just dream about just doing a little bit of a myectomy there, this septum is probably 1.8 centimeter, that patient is gonna come out of the OR with the same problem. So what do you have to do there? Right? You have to address the valve. Right? This is what we did in this patient where the patient had myectomy and you can clearly see an area of myectomy there, but also mitral valve repair, valve was placated. Right? And you can see now that there's no significant obstruction with a gradient of 15 down from, again, 200. So what are the deleterious consequences of LVOT obstruction, mitral regurgitation? Uh, impaired relaxation that is slow dependent, uh, there's decreased coronary perfusion, the LV has to work more, the supply demand is ischemia because of the increased LV, LV pressures, right? And there's mid-systolic drop in, in ejection velocities, right? So what is this? This is like you're driving in the highway at, at full speed and every five minutes you are putting the brakes, right? If that, happen, that happens in the heart, you know, every, every single beat, this is, this is going to lead to burned out HCM. Okay, what are the clinical outcomes uh, related to obstruction? As you can see here, very straightforward patients with obstruction, they have a higher incidence of HCM related death, sudden death, and also worsening heart failure symptoms. This is an old study in which patients, uh, patients that had uh, myectomy where the obstruction was resolved, they were excluded. So clearly you can see the impact there. The newer study where the patients with myectomy were included, right, it showed that there's no difference with HCM related death. So what is the meaning of this? that the survival now in these patients after myectomy is equal to anybody else without even obstruction, right? The problem is that the worsening in heart failure is still happening in that population. Okay, let's shift gears now to the non-obstructive group, right? Non-obstructive by definition, a peak, uh, an LVOT gradient, peak LVOT gradient less than 30, right? This study, the message here, uh, study conducted by Martin Maro, is that 39% of the patients have non-obstructive HCM. For the most part, those patients, they do very well. It has uh, NYHA class one to two symptoms. But there's a small percentage of patients, about 5%, and there's some studies since five to 10%, that they will experience significant symptoms that will develop advanced heart failure. This is consistent with an, another study by AHR, one of my co-fellows when I, I did imaging, uh, that showed that the prevalence again of mid and apical HCM is about 5%. Half of these patients will have severe symptoms, as you can see here. Severe symptoms and mortality in these patients correlated 
uh, with mid HCM, small cavity, as you can see here, and crushed cavity, right? And also apical aneurysms, as you can see here. And also you can see in these MRI images here, uh, where you can see that apical aneurysm and also all that fibrosis involved that apical cap that uh, essentially scarred out and uh, infarcted. Right. And some other examples of apical ACM without that apical aneurysm. Diastolic dysfunction, that's another determinant of symptoms, right? So what are the causes of diastolic dysfunctions? We know, as I mentioned, those cross bridges are increased in patients with HCM, right? Uh, so uh, that is the functional subject for that. Hypertrophy is the anatomical subject for for uh, also diastolic dysfunction, right? That results in decreased, decreased compliance and, and decreased LV filling pressures. And it's an important cause of symptoms. Uh, markers of diastolic dysfunction correlate with BMP and are also associated with reduced survival in this population. Myocardial ischemia can happen in these patients. Now they have, you have hypertrophy, you have to fit that thick heart muscle, right? So there's a supply and demand mismatch. There's like any other human being, they can be epicardial coronary artery disease. Uh, in that regards, patients uh, with HCM, they also have frequently myocardial breaches, right? Uh, you have also ischemia related to increased wall tension in patients with obstruction. And this is an example of uh, a NUC study where you, you see clearly ischemia and stress compared with rest. Uh, the patient had no coronary disease after the patient went to myectomy. You see that all that ischemia again is gone. Uh, again, this is all related to the man ischemia related to the obstruction. They also have microvascular disease. The impact of atrial fibrillation and ACM. As I said, the prevalence is about 20%. Um, thromboembolism in these patients happened with an incidence of 3.8% per year. Uh, atrial fibrillation predictors in this population age left atrial size, as you can see here, right? Um, increase the risk of death related to heart failure and stroke, but not due to sudden cardiac death. Chest fat score is normally in this population and the risk of thromboembolism in them are, are, is so high that it is not recommended to be used in these patients. When you have a patient with HCM and they have atrial fibrillation, that's automatically anticoagulation. Uh, but uh, warfarin is the preferred uh, mode of anticoagulation. For whatever reason, they cannot take it. They can use the NOAX or DOAX, right? So let's shift to the second part of, of the talk where we're going to talk about evaluation of uh, management. I'm just going to uh, touch on the key aspects of the evaluation, right? The first aspect is the role of genetic testing in HCM, right? Uh, Pathogenic mutations uh, by genetic testing can be identified in, in up to 60% of uh, the patients with HCM. How is that useful for your patient? Well, uh, it's not useful in, in restratifying these patients, right? A mutation, there are no mutation that has been identified that leads to worse outcomes in these patients. That being said, uh, there are some patients, and this will be very rare, that can present with uh, two different mutations. And this is the case of one of our patients, a patient that I met in the intensive care unit uh, that have presented with mutations for long QT syndrome and HCM at the same time. He presented with cardiac arrest, right? This happened in one in a million person, right? Uh, he would argue that this genetic testing will be helpful to uh, tell us about his prognosis, right? But it can be used also to confirm diagnosis. When you have a patient that has hypertension, you're not sure what it is, uh, genetic testing again can be helpful. Uh, but more importantly, it, it will enable the cascade genetic uh, screening of the relatives. And that's the key thing that all the guidelines are trying to push. Importantly, uh, patients that are going to have genetic testing, they need to have genetic counseling, pre and post testing, right? All the guidelines support this in all ACM patients and all, all the first degree relatives of a patient uh, with HCM in which a mutation is identified, they should also have genetic testing and genetic counseling. So what is the workflow here? So genetic testing. When you do genetic testing in a patient with HCM, you can find a patient that has no mutation, right? When the patient has no mutation, and you, you can, you, we don't know what's the mutation that is leading to HCM in that patient, so you can really use that to test the family because you're gonna find a negative result. It's a waste of money, right? So you, you're, you're essentially stuck with cl uh, clinical testing. Right? If the patient has ACM in your clinical testing, you're going to follow the patient, obviously. If it's negative, then you interval screening that we usually recommend with imaging. So we see the patient yearly with uh, clinical uh, physical exam history and EKG, but imaging is performed every three to five years. 
uh, in adults, in uh, younger patients, adolescents, it's every year, right? We can find also in genetic testing that the patient has what we call a variance of unknown significance, right? And that, that does not mean that the patient has a negative testing, right? This is a very uh, common misconception in patients. They think, oh, my result was fine. And in fact, we know that those patients have poor prognosis, right? Which means that those, those variants of unknown significance at some point are gonna be end up being pathogenic. Right, what, so what should we do in those cases? Most companies that uh, provide genetic testing, they provide uh, segregation analysis, which is essentially testing all the family to, to try to segregate and see that, that those mutations segregate with patients that are affected. And we can find, and we can define this as a new pathogenic mutation, right? Now you can have also the pathogenic uh, mutation results, right? That's very helpful then that will allow you to do cascade genetic testing in the family members. If the patient, if the family member is negative, then you can forget about it, right? You're not gonna develop the condition, right? If you have a positive genetic testing, that doesn't mean that you have the condition, that means that you're at risk, but you do your imaging testing. If you have HCM, obviously you have to follow up. If you don't have HCM, you need long-term follow-up with periodic uh, uh, imaging exam. Okay, sudden cardiac death in patients with HCM. It's the modern description of ACM uh, in a young uh, asymptomatic patient or individual, right? HCM is the leading cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes, athletes in the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, uh, where um, uh, EKG, EKG, uh, EKG screening is, is, is not done. Uh, BTBF is the most common rhythm. Uh, the incidence, as I said before, about 1% in unselected patients, in patients, uh, such as patients with apical HCM and that apical aneurysm, it can be as high as 3 to 5%, right? So all the guidelines, European and American, recommend that the patient should undergo comprehensive sudden cardiac risk stratification at the initial evaluation and periodically, right? But there are differences between that uh, we do things here in the United States and, and differences between what happened in Europe. So this is what we do in the United States. We look at major risk factors. So what are the major risk factors for, uh, for solid character in patients with HCN? Any takers? It's your syncope, good. Issue of sudden cardiac death in the family members, right? Good, syncope, sudden cardiac death, what else? If you have massive hypertrophy, right? Good, 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 good. All right, so family history of sudden cardiac death, especially in younger, younger family members. Unexplained syncope, uh, mainly when this happened within the, the, the uh, last six months, right? And happening in younger individuals, and if it's happening in, uh, recurrently, or, or with exertion, right? Massive thickness, how do we define massive LV thickness? you know, three centimeters or more, right? Not sustained between halter. That's another major major factor. And also an abnormal blood pressure response to exercise. When you exercise, your systolic blood pressure has to go about uh, the baseline by 20 uh, millimeters of mercury. If that's not happening, that's a normal blood pressure response. And if there's a fall in the blood pressure with exercise, that's even more, more predicted. Right. Other modifiers you can see here, left atrial size, central fibrillation, obstruction, the apical aneurysm, born that HCM, and the patient uh, uh, is an athlete, compound mutations, and, and gadolinium enhancement on CMR. So now you have risk factors. So but what identifies a risk factor? How many risk factors do you need to, to say you are at significant risk based on our American guidelines? One, two, three. One, who gives more? Two, there you go, two, three. So based on this study, right, where patients with uh, HCN that receive ICD, they look at uh, the rates of events uh, based on the risk profile, the risk factors, and you can see that you have one risk factor, you have increased uh, risk, which is similar to two or three risk factors. So one risk factor is enough uh, to refer your patient for, for an ICD. Okay. And this is the algorithm. Again, if you, has, you have a secondary prevention, you already had an arrest, you go to ICD, no brainer, right? If you have your risk factors, you have ICD is reasonable, right? And ICD is reasonable. Right, this, late galvanic enhancement uh, by MRI, um, how that, that help us? When the guidelines, the European and US guidelines were written, this study was not published. And the reason that, uh, Delayed adrenaline enhancement was not 
included as so one of the major risk factors is that a lot of patients with uh, HCM, they will have a lot of fibrosis. 42%, in fact, in this study, had uh, some degree of fibrosis by MRI, right? And the studies done at the time, they were, they were using reports of fibrosis or not fibrosis. Right, which is which is something that it wasn't it, it proved not to be helpful, right? But in this study uh, done by Chan and colleagues, they actually quantify the degree of fibrosis. And as you can see here, the percent of fibrosis of LV mass was correlated nicely with uh, sudden cardiac death events. Looking at the Kaplan-Meier curve and also on this graph bar. Uh, based on this study, we uh, currently use a delay uh, cutoff of 15% of the total LV mass. Uh, which correlated with a two-fold increase in sudden cardiac death. Uh, so if we have a patient uh, that had that degree of fibrosis, personally, even though it's not part of the guidelines, I refer the patient for an ICD. And this is one where uh, a few of our patients, and you can see here in the MRI, the myocardium looks black, dark, very nice, right? There's no fibrosis there, right? You see in this patient, you see all this is fibrosis, all this is fibrosis, and we can quantify this fibrosis at 42% of uh, the LV is fibrosis, right? So this patient has very high risk for sudden cardiac death and also very high risk for progression to born that uh, HCM, right? And the, in fact, this patient, where we did a whole time monitor on him, he was having runs of not sustained BT as well. So this patient was referred immediately for an ICD. In Europe, they, they do things a little bit different. Uh, this uh, is based on a, a registry study, multi-center uh, registry study where they came up with statistical methods and they derive a risk score, right? And these are the factors that are including in risk score, in the risk score. You have age, this is new, maximum wall thickness, we have that already in our system, left atrial size, LVOT gradient, right? Family history, you have heard about that, US guidelines, no sustained BT, syncope. So most of the factors are already included in our approach in the United States. Um, particularly, this is, this is a little troubling to me, as LVOT obstruction is something that you can fix, right? So this you can modify. So uh, patients based on this score, they, you calculate a risk score and you, you, you classify the patients in low risk, intermediate, high risk, right? If the risk is more than 6% or if there is less than 4% low risk, right? And then you, you, if you're high risk, I see this consider, if you're low risk, not consider intermediate, it might be considered or not. Now the problem with this uh, predictive model is this. And this is a study that was done by B.J. Maron, where they essentially apply them, uh, this model to their, their population. And you can look at these two columns, right? These patients, based on their uh, risk score, right? This is a patient that experienced sudden death and appropriate ICD discharges. And you can see less than 4% is low risk. And these patients die. This patient has discharges. 60% of those patients that were classified as low risk they were, they're still, they die, right? So this is not sensitive enough. That's why not in my practice, I, I don't use it. I use it in, in a patient that wants to learn about numbers and want to know about the statistics and his probabilities, but I don't really believe in it. All right, so what to do with exercise, right? So what, what, is, all the, what is all the concern about uh, exercise in ACM? Uh, ACM is the leading cause of death in young athletes. And uh, you can see data from the United States. You know, 35% of the ACM is responsible for 35%, uh, actually more than 40% of the deaths in young competitive athletes, right? Uh, and that's why we are very really cautious, very skeptical about participation of young athletes in competitive sport again. Uh, so the recommendations are that the patient should not participate in, co in competitive sports. Low intensity uh, and recreational sports are reasonable, right? And this is supported by all these guidelines, uh, H uh, HCM guidelines from United States, from Europe, and other uh, statement uh, documents, right? Now, low intensity. That means that the patient will be stuck doing yoga, golf, and bowling. Right? For, for a lot of my patients, that would be okay. Uh, for another group of my patients, they will simply uh, commit suicide, right? So luckily, we're building up some data on, on the safety of exercise in HCM. And these are a couple of studies. This, in this study, uh, 35 uh, HCM athletes uh, were advised to stop. Of those patients, 20 patients stopped, 15 continued. 
right? Of all these patients that stop and continue, they were compared, there was only one sudden cardiac event, right? With an event rate of 0.3% per year, which is very low, right? And when we compare the groups, there was no significant difference between those who compare in, in terms of uh, survival, right? Patients that continue versus the one that no, uh, did not continue. Now, this is based on 35 patients, right? So you have to take this with a grain of salt. Now, what about moderate exercise? This was tested in the RESET 8CM uh, study where um, patients exercise 60 minutes per session, four to seven uh, times per week, at, at the 60% of the maximum predicted heart rate to a board scale of 11 to 14, which is somewhat hard, right? There were no uh, sudden cardiac death events or sustained VT. Now, we did uh, observe that numerically, even though statistically it was not significant, in the exercise group, there was more non sustained VT. Now, when we look at these patients, those patients had already a history of no sustained VT and they were at very high risk, right? So what is our practical approach to exercise uh, in HCM? So we have to evaluate the patients for ma major uh, sudden cardiac death predictors. We have to exclude high risk features, like the patient has a drop in EF, has class four symptoms, they have obstruction, right? It's also reasonable to do a baseline treadmill test, right? To see what's the blood pressure response, right? The blood pressure response, you know, if they have a hypotensive response as a patient at high risk. Uh, arrhythmias uh, during the treadmill, the patient having symptoms, and what is the maximum predicted heart rate of that patient? You can calculate that as based on the study that I just show you, and then we can discuss about uh, low moderate intensity exercise, right? You have to encourage hydration in these patients uh, during the exercise. You have to avoid, uh, avoid adverse environments and use a symptom limited approach, right? You tell your patient, you know, be smart about exercise. If you're having symptoms, stop. Uh, when you feel that you're back to baseline, then you can resume, right? Um, symptomatic patients, symptomatic management of these patients. So we have to classify the patient in obstructive or non-obstructive. Right. So in patients with obstruction, beta blockers, the first line, right? That reduces the exercise and VOT gradient. And usually we push the beta blockers to a heart rate of 50 to 60. Calcium channel blockers, they are a good sub substitute and they do the same uh, mechanisms, right? Disopyramide, it's a class one, one A antiarrhythmic. Why do we use disopyramide in patients with ACN? We can use it sometimes when they have a fibrillation and we put them in disopyramide. Okay, so we don't use it because it's an antiarrhythmic. We use it because it's a very potent negative inotrope. And I show you, that was the reason that I show you all those graphs and we're trying to de delay that acceleration. We're trying to delay that septal contact to minimize obstruction. That's why we use this, right? We have to use it in combination with a beta blocker uh, and a calcium channel blocker because disopyramide can increase your AV node conduction. Right. Uh, unfortunately, it does have pretty bad side effect profile, anticholinergic uh, effects. Patient have dry mouth, dry eyes, a lot of constipation. Constipation is a big one, right? And they have QTC prolongation. If you had to monitor the renal function, one of my patients recently I had to take him off because his renal function worsened uh, related to some other issues, and and we just couldn't uh, continue using it. When medications fail, surgery is another alternative, and. Uh, Jason could uh, talk to you uh, more than I know about this. Uh, in patients that are not surgical candidates, alcohol ablation is an option, right? Catheter-based therapy where you identify a septal branch, you inject alcohol, and that septal peripheral is gone and compared with that baseline MRI, now you can see that that chunk of muscle is, is missing there, right? And this is one of our examples. This is a patient of, Unfortunately, it's kind of caught up in there, uh, but the gradient went down from, again, from 100. After that, um, alcohol septal ablation that you can see there, that big septal branch, I will inject alcohol and that branch is now gone. The gradient went down immediately to the teens. So it can be, it's very effective, it can be very effective. You do have to identify a good uh, septal branch for this. Now, uh, complications, pacemaker, 20% cardiac tamponade and then it's relatively low, right? And this is, this is one of the problems with alcohol ablation, you get all this nice scar tissue there. With myectomy, you really don't have that. So in my mind, that creates a bias for me to try to avoid sending my patients to get a big scar like this in a, in a group of patients that is already pro with me for all the reasons that we just discussed. The truth is that any study that you looked at, outcomes of myectomy versus ablation, there's no difference. 
with exception of this, this paper where they did a subgroup analysis and they found that patients that are younger, less than 65 years of age, uh, those patients do better uh, with myectomy than with alcohol ablation. off will use the use of mitral clip, right? Uh, mitral clip in this study was uh, used in about five patients, and you can see that the LVOT uh, gradient went from 91 to 12, right? Left atrial pressure fell and the MR improved, right? And as you can see here, uh, clips are not moving, uh, but it's a lot of turbulent flow, and after the clip, there's really no obstruction there. When you look at CAT data, again, catheter-based data, you see that grading how drop significantly. In our experience, we have used it in few patients. And as you can see here, this is pre mitral clip. You see, again, what I was trying to show you, a significant gradient. Uh, and after the clip, as Jason explained all the, the technique about this, you can see how there's no, after the clip is deployed, there's no significant turbulent flow or obstruction at this point. And you can see how from baseline, the gradient went down from about 50 to about 25. And you can see again in 3D, the clip in, in position. All right, uh, what about patients without obstruction? What should we do about them? And that's the second case number two, right? Treat uh, with beta blockers to try to decrease, increase filling time. Uh, hoping that you're gonna get a little more stroke volume and improve that patient. Verapamil does the same. There's a little bit of evidence that shows that Verapamil may improve uh, diastolic function in these patients. In my opinion, it's hit and miss. It's, 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 it's not that helpful. And diuretics, right? So uh, very limited options in this group. Very limited options. Surgical approaches to non-obstructive HCM. One of those approaches is apical myectomy. Uh, Mayo Clinic is a group that has done a lot. Uh, and the premise here of this therapy is that you essentially you create a cavity in the ventricle, right? To create more uh, room for stroke, to increase your stroke volume, therefore cardiac output, as you can see there. In this study, they, uh, of their more recent report of their experience, they included 113 patients. Uh, patients, 96% of them were class three or four. And you can see, again, those patients improve in terms of their quality of life uh, and also, uh, their survival, they compare with patients in the wait list, they have better survival, obviously the patients in the heart transplant wait list. And when you compare patients with transplant, which is usually what we send these patients for, if we don't do this approach, right? They're very similar, they have very similar survival. Okay, so another uh, surgical approach for non-obstructive HCM, uh, it's the use of left ventricular assist devices that have been shown in a small case here from Mayo Clinic 2, where they use it. Now, the caveat here is that this patient, they had a ventricle of six, uh, about five and a half at least. You know, the problem here is that these patients usually they have a very small ventricle, right, which predisposes to elbow thrombosis. So it can, be, it can be challenging. Transplant, these are analysis from our group using the UNOS data set, and we show that patients with HCM, they have very good outcomes, short and long-term, even better than other groups. Novel therapies. Right. This is this is and this is why I show you all the mechanism uh, involved. Why, what what happens with the genetic mutations? This is a, a new drug. It's called Mavicamptan. Right. This drug essentially modifies how the actin and the myosin interact. Right. By doing that, you you are you are decreasing contractility and also you are allowing improving uh, improving relaxation. Right. So you have with HCM increasing the cross bridges with Mavicamptan. Again, you have less cross bridges, which improve diastology and diminishes contractility and improves gradient. This was tested in the Pioneer trial where they test different doses, high dose cohort A, low dose cohort B, right? Some exclusion criteria, but the message here is that they, in both cohorts, the gradient improved, more so uh, in the patient in the high dose group from a gradient from 100 went down to, to the 20s. I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. Now, what is coming from Abbey Campton? Uh, currently, we're, we're enrolling patients. We, we complete enrollment for the phase three trial, which is Explorer. This is a patient with obstructive HCM, uh, and we're in the follow up phase of these patients now. Maverick has completed enrollment too. This is assessing the use of Maverick Campton in patients with no obstruction, just diastolic dysfunction. All right, and lastly, the delivery of care in HCM. 
as I, as I have mentioned, I hope I conveyed that message, HCM is a complex and heterogeneous condition, right? So the diagnosis and management of these patients require a range of skills and uh, competencies, right? So uh, whichever way we try to approach these patients, either using a centralized approach or a less centralized approach where uh, the patients are seen in different centers, what uh, all uh, societies uh, recommend is that the care should meet the standards of care uh, in terms of sudden cardiac death surveillance, management of their symptoms, genetic test, testing, and all the factors that were visited today, right? When you have diagnostic uncertainty, you should refer to a specialty team, multidisciplinary team, experiencing the care of patients with HCM. Uh, they have a softer recommendation, these guidelines in terms of referring all the patients uh, with HCM to uh, centers of excellence. Luckily, there's uh, a growth in the in interest in, in the care of patients with HCM. And this is the model uh, that is being used now in the United States where a homologist uh, is in charge of all these uh, so specialties and they have in charge of his patients with all these technologies. And when a uh, homologist needs to refer a patient to genetics, to mental health, surgery, advanced heart failure, he will refer those patients to those uh, subspecialties and then he'll be in charge of, uh, again, those patients will come back to the homologist. Now, in the United States, the Hypertrophic Myopathy Association is in charge of designating centers of excellence. As you can see here, there are about 37 uh, centers of excellence uh, where uh, we focus on the multidisciplinary management uh, of these patients. University of Utah is one of them. Uh, you see the East Coast Prehavian Centers. We have a lot of, lot of opportunity here in, this, in, in the Midwest and in the West side for for patients. So going back to our patients, patient number one, uh, patient with LVLT obstruction and had high uh, gradient spine medical therapy, right? This, this patient in the algorithm from the American guidelines will fall in this path, right? He fell to medical therapy, had still symptoms. He was candidate for surgery, so this patient went for myectomy. So you can see there, uh, there's a myectomy done and the patient had no SAM and no significant obstruction with symptomatic improvement. Patient number two is not obstructed. Apical mid HCM, very low stroke volume. You learn that there's, there's bad outcomes in this patient, a lot of symptoms and poor prognosis. What should we do? Transplant, 70 years old, a little too old for at least our cutoff. There are programs that the cutoff is 72, possible. All right, so this patient again follows here. You already have the patient diuretics, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, that didn't work. So in this case, we refer, we, I refer this patient to my surgeon and she had apical myectomy. And as you can see here, compared with that cavity, there's significant improvement in her cavity size. And this patient did, did much better. She's doing well from class four symptoms. She's having class two, right? Having better quality of life. So in summary, HCM is complex and has an heterogeneous genotype phenotypic expression. Uh, it's associated with disabling symptoms and then in young adults. Genetics can be helpful for cascade screening of relatives. ICDs are life-saving for select patients. However, the performance of our predictive algorithms is very limited at this time. While effective current therapies are not disease-specific and target symptoms. Future directions, future studies should focus on improve, improving recertification schemes and also on develop uh, novel specific disease modifying agent strategies for, uh, for this condition. 